Swinburne University of Technology. Hi everyone and welcome back. This week, uh, once we've done a recap of last week, we're going to be looking at a new statistical test. And so this week's test that we're going to be looking at is the independent samples t-test. Before we do that though, let's warm up our brains. I've got a brain teaser for you. So I have this paragraph here, I'll get you to read through it. You might want to press pause and have a read through. And something really unusual about this paragraph. Quite a few sentences in the paragraph, it's quite unusual. Something unusual, what's missing? So, hopefully you noticed, or you might have noticed, uh, the thing that is missing from this paragraph is the letter E. Letter E is the most common letter, and it's very unusual to have a paragraph of this length without the letter E in it. Um, if you don't believe me, try and try and write a paragraph about something and make it coherent and not use the letter E. It's actually very tricky. Okay, so last time we were looking at research design and we were looking at variables. So the first thing we looked at was independent, the difference between an independent variable and a dependent variable. Being able to distinguish in a scenario between the independent variable and the dependent variable is very, very important. So remember the independent variable, when we're thinking about some sort of relationship, the uh, direction of the cause and effect, if there's a cause and effect, is that the independent variable somehow influences or affects the dependent variable. So the direction is the dependent variable, and we can remember dependent, it depends. So the dependent variable depends on the independent variable. Sometimes it might have a tricky scenario where it's uh, hard to work out which one uh, is which. Uh, sometimes it's a bit easier though. You can imagine maybe if we had something like uh, we were looking at the relationship between share prices on the stock market and time. Time could potentially affect share prices. So share prices might depend on time. But it would be quite a worry if time depended on share prices, because it would be uh, quite upsetting if the stock market had some sort of crazy time trap or influence on all of us. So that was independent dependent variables. We then looked at research designs. So the first was whether we had a design which was observational or experimental. And the key difference between those two was whether or not the independent variable had been manipulated. So had someone as part of the design of the study, had some control over the levels or the values of the independent variable. If they'd had some sort of uh, control to change it, then it's an experiment. Otherwise, it's an observational study. Uh, every so often, you have students that will say something like, the uh, researcher tried to manipulate the sample or tried to manipulate the people. But the key thing that we're interested in is whether the researcher is manipulating the independent variable. Hopefully they're not manipulating the participants or each other. So we then also had different varieties of study. Uh, we had independent, we had repeated measures, and we had matched pairs. So independent samples is where we have two samples that are completely collected separately independently of one another. Repeated measures is where we have the same units, quite often the same people, and we take multiple measurements. Uh, most of the examples that we look at, it tends to be two measurements, so you can imagine something like a before and an after with the same people would be a repeated measures. The last one, a matched pairs, kind of a little bit halfway between the other two. So it's looking, it's trying to create two sets of data where it is two different groups of whatever we're, whatever our units are, so let's just say people, but we've tried to match them up as closely as possible. So we've made, tried, intentionally tried to make the two groups as similar as possible. So kind of matching one to one. We then looked at nuisance variables. So a nuisance variable is a variable in our study, which is not the independent variable, so not the one we're actually interested in, but it is somehow 
correlated to the dependent variable. So it, it, as well as the independent maybe independent variable may be having an effect on the dependent variable, our nuisance variables also do. So when we're designing our study, we want to try and design it in a way that the what we're seeing is the effect of the independent variable and not the nuisance variable. The next thing we looked at was confounding factors. The confounding factor is uh, correlated to the independent variable and to the dependent variable. So what this means is that when we are trying to work out whether the independent variable has an impact or not, we don't know because it could be the independent variable or it could be the confounding factor. And the last thing we looked at was some different sampling methods. So we looked at simple random sampling, cluster sampling, systematic sampling, stratified sampling, and a couple of non-random methods. So if you haven't already, make sure that you do some interactive room practice. Go and read the textbook. Uh, this section in particular students do find quite tricky. Um, the independent, identifying independent and dependent variables is a skill that you are required to have in order to pass the unit. Uh, some of the others, particularly the confounding factors, can be quite tricky, so we normally mark those as higher order questions. So for the, the students that are heading towards distinctions and high distinctions, they are the ones that are good at being able to identify problems and research design and nuisance variables and confounding factors and things like that. Okay, so the new topic for today is the independent samples t-test. This is sometimes also known in some textbooks as a two-sample t-test. And so with this test, the idea is that we have two groups and we're trying to compare the population means between these two groups. And so in order to do this, we're going to have sample means from each group. And so again, it's inference. We're trying to infer something about the population based on the sample. So we're trying to say something about the difference, if there is difference between the two population means based on our two sample means for these two groups. So when we're doing this test, there are a number of assumptions that uh, we should check. The first one is that our dependent variable, so the thing we're comparing, is a metric variable. So because we're comparing means, you can only compare means on metric variables, so that's a pretty easy thing for us to check. Second is the independence of the observations. So each of our measurements on our dependent variable are independent of the others. So we can normally tell this by reading our scenario and just seeing how the sample is selected. The next assumption relates to our data. And so there's an assumption that the populations are normally distributed. Of course, we can't actually see the distribution of the populations, but what we can do is we can just have a look at the shapes of the samples. So we would plot histograms and we would see whether we get kind of just approximately a bell curve shape. The independent samples t-test is uh, fairly robust to a uh, slight departure from non-normality. Non so if we have uh, histograms that don't quite look like a bell curve, that is not an issue. If we have very, very skewed data, then this isn't the right test for us to be doing without first doing uh, some sort of transformation of our data. The last assumption we have here is equal variances. So the normal independent samples t-test requires the two groups to have very similar spread. Uh, with the SPSS output, it actually produces two lines of output one for if you do have this assumption met, so our variances, and our variance is just a measure of spread, so the two groups are similarly spread out, and then one line for if the two groups are not similarly spread out. So whilst this is an assumption of the independent samples t-test, it's actually not a big deal for us, because the only thing that alters is which row of our SPSS output we will read from. So we're going to have a look at some examples uh, in order to look at this new t-test. So our first one, our research question, is a, blood, a person's blood cholesterol level related to the amount of exercise they do? So we are going to be looking at blood cholesterol. It's our dependent variable. It's metric. It's, measured, uh, it's a measured number. And so 
we're going to have an independent variable which is exercise regularly and do not re exercise regularly. So I've got two groups and for each of those groups they're going to have a mean blood cholesterol level that we're going to compare. So we want to write a hypothesis. Remember a hypothesis is not a question. And so our hypothesis is that blood cholesterol level for those who do not exercise regularly differs from those who do. When we are writing our hypothesis, quite often, either from the scenario or from um, the information that we have, we can have a directional hypothesis, so using a greater than or a less than. Sometimes, though, we not, might not be sure, we might not know whether it's going to be higher or lower. And so in those cases, we might have a hypothesis like this, where we're just seeing, are they different? And once we've established they're different, then we can describe how they are different. So we've got some data, and if you've downloaded the data, textbook data sets off Blackboard, you should hopefully have this data set as well. And we can run our independent samples t-test. Before we do that though, we're going to run the explore procedure just to check our assumptions. Okay, so we've run our explore procedure. We can see the means are highlighted. Uh, we can see that those who do not re exercise regularly, their mean blood cholesterol level is about 247 compared to 189 for those who exercise regularly. So our independent samples t-test is going to tell us, based on these samples, do we think that the population means vary? We can have a quick look here. Here's our variance. So the variance is just the standard deviation squared. Here's our variance again down here. And we can see they're not exactly the same, but they're pretty similar. Um, but when we get our t-test output, it will tell us whether or not the uh, variances are equal. Here's our histograms, and our histograms, with our histogram, we're just checking to see whether we think that these are kind of vaguely from a normal distribution. So with maybe a little bit of imagination, we can see that this is kind of a bit of a bell curve shape. And this one over here, again, a little bit of imagination. It doesn't look super skewed. Both of them look like they are approximately a normal distribution. So we'd be happy with this for doing our t-test. Looking at our box plots, our box plots don't tell us about normal distribution, but they do tell us about spread. And here we can see pretty similar spread in cholesterol levels for the two groups. So let's just check our assumptions. The dependent variable is metric, yes. The way that it's collected, uh, we didn't really see the scenario for that, but it was collected in a way where we expect the measurements to be independent. One person's blood cholesterol level doesn't depend on someone else's. We then uh, had a look at the normality. We saw pretty, pretty good bell curve shapes. And equal variances, they did look like pretty similar spread in each of our two uh, groups. So here is our independent samples t-test. So we get our output. The first thing that we do is we have a look at our what's called the Levine's test. So the very first two columns show me what's called the Levine's test. And so that's the one with the big arrow pointing at it. And that tells me whether to continue with looking at the top row or to look at the bottom row. So the way we know whether to look at the top row or the bottom row is we look at that p-value for the Levine's test. And 0.711 means it is not significant. So that means we can assume equal variances and we can use the top row. If that was a small number, smaller than 0.05, then we would use the bottom row instead. And that's the last thing that we use them for. We don't need to quote it in our report. We don't need to do anything else with it. All it's telling us about is whether to look at the top row or the bottom row. So we've got this 0.711. It's telling us let's use the top row. So again, we have a T value. T value is going to go into our report. We've got a degrees of freedom. It's going to go into our report. Here is our really important one, our p-value. So our p-value tells us about whether we think there is a significant difference between the means of the two groups. And we can see here this p-value, 0.000. So when we see 0.000, it's actually not 
the figure, but it's the figure rounded to three decimal places. So you can imagine this p-value is, is going to be very, very small because it rounds to zero. But zero would mean a probability of zero, so that it couldn't possibly happen. So what we're really seeing would be something like 0. 0.00001 or something like that. So very, very, very small. And so a very small p-value tells me that there is a significant difference between the means of the two groups. So that's important for us writing our report and also quoting our p-value. The last two figures we're going to need are these ones down here. And so these are for the confidence interval for the difference. So these two are telling me about the difference between the means of my two groups. So saying that we think that the mean blood cholesterol level for those that don't exercise is between 42.9 and 74.3 higher than for those who do exercise. So again, because we have a significant difference, then we will be quoting our confidence interval in our report. Okay, so let's have a look at the report. There's a little bit more in this report than there is in the um, in the one sample t-test. Still has the same structure though. So, first section here is our hypothesis. And so you can see it starts out a researcher hypothesized, but we could start that out as it was hypothesized or it was suggested or there's all sorts of different ways we could uh, start the sentence and it doesn't really matter as long as it's coherent. What is important though is that we describe what it is we're looking at, which is blood cholesterol level. And we are comparing people who do not exercise regularly and those that do. And for this particular hypothesis, we are saying that we are testing to see whether they differ. Perhaps if we knew a little bit more about it, we might have said a greater than or a less than, but for this particular one, we're saying differ. So we then start off by describing our sample. We had a sample size of 78. Uh, this particular scenario, we didn't have a lot of information other than that these people were adults, but you can imagine if these were Australians or New Zealanders or some other particular group, we'd make sure we put it in there. We don't always have the word random because our sample is not always random. This particular sample is a random sample, but if your sample was not random, then you wouldn't put the word random in there. So, we start off by saying what we're measuring, which is average blood cholesterol levels. Really important that we have the word average. And so we've got the average blood cholesterol levels for the non-exercisers. So, here in brackets, we're quoting our sample statistics. The X with the little line above it, which is called X bar, is the sample mean. So 247.65, we got off our output uh, or our explore procedure, and that is my sample mean. S is my sample standard deviation, so it's 33.44, and my sample size was 43, so it was 43 non-exercises. And then we compare this to the other group. And so we saw that the blood cholesterol for the non-exercisers was higher. It's important that we're saying higher. And again, using sensible word, don't say better. Then our second group was those that exercise regularly. Again, here's sample mean, sample standard deviation, sample size. We then state the name of the test we're doing. So independent samples t-test. And it shows that the difference in the mean blood cholesterol levels is significant. So again, really important to say what is it that is significant, and it's the difference in the mean blood cholesterol levels. We don't want to say it is significant. We don't want to say just the difference. We actually want to state what it is. We know it was significant because the p-value was very, very small. We then quote our test statistics. So in the brackets, we've got the T, and then in the brackets is my degrees of freedom, which is 76. After the equals, we've got the T value, and you can see the T value rounded to two decimal places, 7.44. And then we've got our P value. And our P value, this is the one time where we do something slightly different with our P value. So 
the p-value was, even though it said 0. 0.000 in our output, that's really not what it was. That's just the rounded value. So because we don't want to be saying the p-value is actually 0, instead the way that we phrase it is p is less than 0. 0.001. So we know that it's very small, we don't know quite how small, but we know it's smaller than that. For any other p-value, we're actually quoting what the figure is, but when it says 0, 0, 0, we quote it like this instead. We then have our confidence interval. So our 95% confidence interval tells me that the average blood cholesterol for people who do not exercise regularly is between 42.9 and 74.3 higher than people that do. So we only put our confidence interval in when the test the shows us that the difference is not is significant. If the test is not significant, there's no point in having a confidence interval there. Okay, and so finally we've got our conclusion. So as expected, the average cholesterol levels of non-exercisers do differ from those who exercise regularly. And we want to clarify this. We hypothesize they were different, we've shown they're different. But we can also class, uh, clarify by saying, on average, they are higher. You'll also notice that we are in the present tense, so we're saying do instead of did. So we're now talking about the population, and then so that we're saying there is a difference in the population. So the difference between these two groups, these two groups do differ, as opposed to saying the sam in the sample they did differ. It's quite a subtle distinction, but we do want to make sure that in our conclusion we are talking about our population rather than our sample. Okay, so let's have a look at another example. So in this example we're looking at uh, the travel times for full-time workers and part-time workers. So let's jump straight into our output. So in our output, uh, remember the first thing we jump to is to go and look at our Levine's test. So we've got the 0 0.352, so it's not significant. And so not significant tells me to use the top line. So using the top line, here's our p-value. Again, little tiny p-value, 0.000 telling me that there is a significant difference between the means of my two groups, so between the travel times for my full-time and my part-time workers. Something else that we should note in this output is that my t-value has a negative on it. If we have a t-value and there's a negative on the front of it, when we're writing our, port, our reports, the, um, the convention for the presentation is we drop that negative sign. Again, really important to remember we're dropping that negative sign, we don't just drop negative signs all over the show. So let's have a look at the report. So starting off, we've got our hypothesis. That was hypothesized that people who work full-time spend a longer time traveling to work than part-time workers. So again, different variations we could use in the language there, but it's key that we are talking about the travel time and part-time workers and full-time workers. So we had a random sample of 200 workers. We had, remember, we had 100 full-time and 100 part-time. The average time spent travelling to work by full-time workers was 37.88. So again, making sure that we state it's the average time spent. Starting with the full-time workers, we have x-bar, which is for our sample mean. Quote our sample mean. Quote our sample standard deviation. Quote our sample size. Then we do our comparison. So it was higher than the average travel time for the part-time workers. And then again, quote sample, stand, uh, sample mean, standard deviation, and sample size. We then say independent samples t-test. So we state the name of our test, and it shows that the difference in the mean travel time, so stating what we're comparing, is significant. So again, very small p-value told me that the difference was significant. We then quote our test statistics, so 198 was my degrees of freedom, it goes in the brackets next to the T. Here's that 5.83, so that was the one which had the negative sign on the front of it. We've taken the negative sign off, we've rounded it to two decimal places. And then we've got our p-value, and again that 000 has turned into 0 0.001. 
So the confidence interval is showing me that the average time spent travelling for the full-time workers is between 5.25 and 10.62 minutes longer than for the part-time workers. Here you can see we've dropped the negatives. The reason we've dropped them here is because we're talking about the difference between the full-time and the part-time. So saying that the full-time is negative 5 shorter doesn't make much sense. It's much clearer to say it is 5 minutes longer. And then again, finish with our conclusion, and our conclusion in the present tense, so full-time workers do spend longer time travelling to work than the part-time workers. So this should tie into our hypothesis, it should be in the present tense. Okay, so let's look at one more example. We've got this example uh, looking at electricity consumption, and we're interested to see whether it's higher in the city than it is in rural areas. So... We've got the data set there, electric.sav, if we want to go and do this in SPSS. So firstly, what's our dependent variable and our independent variable? Our dependent variable, the thing we're interested in, is our electricity consumption. And it's a metric variable, so we can use our independent samples t-test for it. And our independent variable is our location. So we've got two different categories, city and rural. Really important when we identify our independent variable that we don't give the levels of the categories, but the actual the, the name of the variable itself. So you can imagine if we had say a categorical categorical variable uh, such as ethnicity, ethnicity would be the name of the variable, whereas European, Australian, Asian, our different levels of the categories. Um, uh, our groups but not the name of our variable. So let's have a look at our output. Here's our output. Uh, we can see the key bits highlighted. One thing we'll notice here with this example is that our Levine's test is significant. It's below 0.05 and so because it's below 0.05 that's why we've come down and we're reading the bottom row instead of the top row. So we've got our T value, we've got our degrees of freedom, we've got our P value, so remember this column is our P value, and so 0.021 is less than 0.05, so again the difference is significant. The difference is significant, but if we come back up here and look at our sample means, the rural mean was 2091, the city mean was 2023. So whilst the difference is significant, in fact, it's actually the rural who have the higher consumption rather than the city. So we've found a difference, but the difference is actually in the opposite direction to what we expected. So let's have a look at the report. This is going to get mentioned in our report. So our first couple of lines is our hypothesis, and so we're saying we hypothesize that the consumption is higher in the city than in rural areas. Again, when we're doing any kind of comparison, higher, lower, greater than, less than, we should state both of the groups. We shouldn't just be saying it is higher in the city and not saying relative, what it's relative to. In the central part of our report, we've got our sample size, 120 households. We've got our keyword in here, average, because we're looking at average electricity consumption. We quote our sample mean, sample standard deviation, and sample size for the city households and for the rural households. We state the name of our test, so independent samples t-test. We have our test statistics, so as our degrees of freedom, our t-stat. Again, notice the minus has gone off the t-stat. And our p-value. And then... Because the difference is significant, we want to interpret our confidence interval. Our confidence interval tells us that the average electricity consumption is between 10.57 and 125.43 lower for city households than for the rural households or country households. So one thing that we do when we write our conclusion, if it was a significant difference but it went the opposite way to what we thought, we use this phrase here, so contrary to expectations. So there was a difference, but it was actually the opposite the way to what we thought it was. So contrary to expectations, the electricity consumption in the city is lower 
candidates for rural households. Okay, so that's it for this week. Um, have a look at module five in the textbook. Make sure you have a go of the exercises there and in the interactive room on Blackboard. There is a SPSS help video on independent samples t-tests and hopefully this week you are going to have a go of topic test five.